Good evening, everyone. Wow, that is quite loud. Uh, we want to take a moment, first of all, and thank all of you for your grace in putting up with uh, our little difficulty day. It is a terrible thing to be so popular that you sell out the smaller venue and have to, at the last minute, shift to the grandness of the Kelly Theater, where we can all practically have a row to ourselves. Uh, we are delighted that you are all here with us tonight. My name is Michelle DeMarzo. I'm the Curator of Education here at the Fairfield University Art Museum. And we are so excited to welcome tonight's speaker, who will be kicking off our exhibition, Rodan Truth, Form, Life, Selections from the Iris and B. Gerald Cantor Foundation. Jennifer Thompson is the Gloria and Jack Drozdek Curator of European Painting and Sculpture and Curator of the John G. Johnson Collection at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And if that were not enough of a mouthful, she's also responsible for the collections and installations at the Rodin Museum in Philadelphia, which is the only museum dedicated to the sculptor's work outside of France. Dr. Thompson earned her master's and her PhD at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, and she joined the Philadelphia Museum of Art's Department of European Painting in 1999. In the last two decades, she has curated or co-curated many notable exhibitions at the PMA, including The Impressionist Eye of 2019, Old Masters Now Celebrating the Johnson Collection of 2017, Van Gogh Up Close in 2012, and Late Renoir in 2010. And before I ask you to join me in welcoming her, I'll note after the, directly after the lecture, we invite you to join us in the lobby for a reception and the opening of our exhibition. And now I invite you to join me in welcoming Jennifer Thompson. Thank you very much, and thank you all for your enthusiasm for, for Rodan and for the exhibition. So it's a great honor to be invited to speak here at the opening of this um, exhibition, which is a small but very powerful gathering uh, that encompasses Rodin's career. And it sort of reveals some of the challenges that he posed to audiences in his day, and I think also some of the appeal that he holds for us 100 years on. Rodin is an extraordinarily complex figure. He had a, also a, a very prolific career. So I thought tonight what I would do is just speak about one project. It's a project um, that encompassed 11 years of his career. It's also quite conveniently related to six objects in the exhibition. Um, and that is his work on the, a major monument devoted to the burghers of Calais. This is a piece that allows us to study how Rodin introduced a sort of a sense of modern ideas of heroism um, to this subject. And as Rodin would like us to do, I'm going to, in slides at least, virtually take us around this, this uh, piece because Rodin felt that the, the back of a sculpture was as important as the front. As you'll see here, he imbues each of his figures with a great sense of individuality, emotion, and character. Here we're seeing them directly from the back, the back side. Details of the figures, their emotions, and gestures. And then, last but not least, some of the details of those feet and hands. These are particularly oversized features of the sculpture. Uh, that was quite a deliberate um, choice on Rodin's part because they needed to be seen from far away. But they're also a, quite nicely ties into to my title and some of the, the comments made by critics shortly after this piece was unveiled in 1895 that the critic Octave Mirbeau said that these fine forms so expressive that they become real states of mind. The burghers leave and the drama shakes you from head to toe. And so I'd like to spend the next 40 minutes or so exploring the drama encapsulated in this, in this particular piece. And one last look at the, at the hands. But to start our story, we have to go back to the 14th century, and specifically to 1328, when King Charles IV of France died without an heir. King Edward III of England felt they needed a good claim to the throne. His mother, Isabella, was the sister of Charles IV. But the French didn't believe in um, secession through women, and so they um, rejected Edward III's claim he took a few years, he didn't, I don't think at the time, he didn't seriously think that he would be able to claim the French throne. But a few years later, he did engage the French in a number of naval battles, 
And then in 1346, he made a siege on the port of Calais, which was, of course, directly across from the English Channel. It was a bold move in that he was determined to sort of make a stake um, to a portion of France. He, of course, the English kings, kings for a number of years had had, um, had had lands in France, but Edward III was being um, quite audacious in, in making a siege on the city of, of Calais. For 11 months, he, his troops surrounded the town, um, starving out the citizens, not allowing them to have any sort of shipments of, of food coming in. Uh, this was a conflict that was um, it was dominated by um, a number of changes in military technology. In particular, the English introduced the longbow, which gave them a great sort of tactical advantage because they were much more accurate. They had reached further distances than some of the French, the French um, instruments of war. But so, the, so that such that Edward III was able to successfully siege the city um, for about 11 months. Um, and it reached a point where the, the citizens within Calais were entirely at the edge of starvation. And so the king, at that point, let it be known to, through an emissary into the city that if the citizens were prepared to send from the city, and I'm, I'm quoting from a 14th century chronicle here, if they were prepared to send from the city six of the most notable burghers, their feet bare, rope around their necks, the keys to the city and of the chateau in their hands. With them, I will do as I please, and on the rest, I will take pity. The account continues on to say that a moment later, there arose the richest burgher, Eustace de Saint-Pierre, who said, Lords, it would be a great misfortune to let such a people die here of famine when one can find another means. I have such a hope of finding grace and pardon from our Lord that if I die in order to save these people, that I want to be the first. I will willingly strip to my shirt, bare my head, put the rope around my neck, and go to the mercy of the King of England. And as you can see here, a number of artists dating back um, to just a few decades after the event, and then well into the future, imagined the, the experience of these burghers, of these six men who were prepared to sacrifice their lives um, and, and to sort of to submit themselves to the English king. Um, as you're seeing here um, and in my next slide by the American painter Benjamin West, um, the story in some respects has a happy ending in that the uh, wife of Edward III, a, a Queen Philippa, was pregnant with their child and she was quite concerned that if her husband were to kill these um, six men as a, 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 a as a sort of model or, or, or as a, um, an example that this would bring bad luck onto their uh, unborn child. And so she asked her husband to spare the lives of the six um, burghers. Um, and so in fact, each of the six men was sent back to the city of Calais, the siege was lifted, um, and uh, it, the, I guess we could say that the, the town um, sort of survived. And each, in fact, each of the six burghers um, would go on to re reclaim um, their lands. This, however, became an extraordinarily um, significant moment um, in, in the history of France. It's a moment um, during the Hundred Years' War in which we, uh, the course of this conflict between England and, and France was one in which we see the rise of nationalism in both, um, in both countries, um, such that 500 years later, I'm fast forwarding us here to the 1880s. Um, the city of Calais is thriving. Um, it's doing so well that in fact, it's making plans to merge with a neighboring suburb that's quite appropriately called Saint-Pierre. And in my I slide, if you can just make it out here, the, um, the city of Calais, I'm so I guess the pointer isn't working. Um, the city of Calais is essentially an, an island um, in, the, um, in the center here, um, surrounded by a number of canals and rivers. And then just the, oh here, sorry, it's probably a, this, this is a pointer was probably better for the, the, the slightly smaller auditorium. Um, but just at the bottom of this map is the suburb of Saint-Pierre, which was being incorporated into um, the city of Calais. They were in the process of demolishing the medieval walls to Calais, and the, the town um, sort of leaders felt that it would be important to have a monument that would encapsulate this uh, sort of union of, of both the town and its neighboring suburb. 
Um, and so they, they wanted to create a monument to Eustace de Saint-Pierre, that, that first burgher who had stepped forward, had the courage um, to surrender to the English king. They started to cast about for sculptors, and the name of Auguste Rodin came up fairly quickly. Rodin was a 40-year-old sculptor with a rising reputation. Um, he had made, come onto the art scene approximately eight years earlier um, in a slightly controversial way. Um, in 1876, he exhibited this piece called The Age of Bronze at the Salon. It immediately called, caused a stir. Um, it was a piece um, to step back a little bit, he had just visited um, Italy. He'd seen the work of Michelangelo, was quite um, taken by the dying slave, amongst other works there. And so when he submitted his piece he, um, to the Salon, he thought that he was, um, he was creating a work um, that would evoke the, the grandest of Renaissance traditions, but also step forward um, into, into the 19th century and say something new. Um, unfortunately, his colleagues immediately accused him of having cast the sculptor from life. Um, they thought that it was so realistic and so sort of beautifully and so perfectly modeled in terms of its anatomy that it could only have been made um, if he had actually taken a model and cast various parts of the, the figure um, in plaster and then had that cast in bronze. Um, he, then got involved in a protracted three-year court case to kind of prove um, that he had, he had modeled this by hand, that it was a great um, sort of and deeply original work. Um, he, so much so that he had to actually produce photographs of his model. You see him here um, on the left, the model posing as, um, as the figure. And if you do a lot of very close comparison, um, you can see that, the, that Rodin has, has not copied his, his model directly from life, um, but that he has, in fact, made a number of interpretations and changes. Um, he was able to clear his name, um, and the, the piece was eventually purchased by the French government and placed in the Luxembourg gardens, which was kind of a very prestigious um, sign, of, so a sign of approval and perhaps of apology for having put um, Rodin um, through this, this ordeal. Um, Rodin, I think, perhaps realized that at this point, like many good publicists do, that sometimes bad publicity is actually good for your, your name and your reputation, um, because this is a moment at which he started to, people started to talk about Auguste Rodin, which they might not have done had he quietly submitted something to the salon and it had sort of fallen under the radar. Radar. Uh, but following that um, sort of experience with the Age of Bronze, uh, Rodin introduces a couple of really significant things into his career. He decides from that point onward that he's no longer going to work on a sort of life scale. So all of his pieces are either smaller than life or larger than life. And that particularly is, is true with his next uh, great salon sculpture, the John the Baptist preaching. This is a, a work that, uh, when it was exhibited at the salon, was seven feet tall, so taller than, than any um, possible model. Uh, you'll see a version of this in the exhibition on a much um, smaller scale, and this is something that Rodin um, loved to do, is to play around with scale and to see what a piece looked like at seven or eight foot scale, and then also what it might look like um, in sort of a one or two foot um, scale. In 1880, he had just been commissioned to create a set of bronze doors um, for, for a new museum that was being planned and was going to be devoted to the decorative arts. Um, this was an extraordinary commission, um, one that perhaps every sculptor in the 19th century might dream of the possibility of being able to create a, a set of bronze doors, a sort of a, a piece that might um, sort of evoke the envy of, of artists going actually all the way back um, to, to the Renaissance. The image I'm showing you here is one that Rodin would never have seen in his lifetime. Um, he never saw the piece cast in bronze. He only saw it in plaster. He worked on it for about 37 years, kind of continually tinkering on it. Um, nevertheless, this was another commission which had, had won um, Rodin a, a, a degree of, of sort of rising fame and also enabled him to start to build a quite significant workshop of people who would help him um, in all of his um, in his sculptures. Um, having just received this commission in 1880, um, it's perhaps somewhat surprising that in 1884 he embraced um, the challenge of creating a monument to Eustace de Saint-Pierre. 
but he was following in the footsteps of a number of other artists. I've shown you some painters who tackled the subjects of the burghers of Calais um, earlier in the, the 19th century, um, specifically around 1820. Um, another sculptor had tried to sort of capture the gravity um, of uh, Eustace um, Saint-Pierre here. And if you can see, this, this perhaps wasn't too much competition for Rodin. This is a very sort of static figure. It's only a bust, um, bust length. Um, and Rodin had had a great deal of, of opportunities to think about monuments, and, and particularly monuments um, that might celebrate defeat, uh, which seems perhaps um, to us an unusual thing today, and that um, you, you would want to perhaps celebrate a victory, um, perhaps a, a there are any number of other um, battles in the midst of the Hundred Years' War that France, um, France won, as opposed to the Battle of the Siege of Calais, which I suppose we could all declare that they had, had lost. Um, this is an example of a monument that, that Rodin had uh, produced, a, a model that he, had, a maquette that he had produced, that he'd hoped would win a competition for a monument that would sort of um, celebrating or commemorating the defense of Paris during the Franco-Prussian War. And it's, it's important to kind of situate this moment in France um, following its, the, the country's sort of defeat um, to the Germans. Um, in in 1870, 1871, they lost, of course, the province of Alsace-Lorraine. It was a terrible blow um, to the French. And so the French government at this stage starts uh, the Third Republic, uh, begins to commission a great number of monuments to kind of rally the citizens um, and to remind them of great moments in French history and to sort of encourage them and propel them forward. Um, this is a one such monument that comes out of this period, um, Emmanuel Fremier's Joan of Arc, this great gilded equestrian monument that stands not too far from the, the Louvre. And this is what, this was essentially Rodin's um, competition at the time, um, a somewhat more traditional subject of a figure on horseback. Joan of Arc, of course, a great um, French heroine. So when Rodin was offered the commission um, for the Burghers of Calais in 1884, he began to do his research. He read all of the historical accounts, um, that excerpt that I read to you from the, um, the chronicle of Jean Froissart, Jean Froissart that talked about the burghers being asked to surrender, um, wearing their sackcloth and the halters around their neck. And Rodin produced this first maquette, a sort of plaster model. It was a sort of a first draft of the, um, of the, the composition that he showed to um, the, the, the leading um, citizens in, um, in, in Calais that were, that were on the, the sort of commission um, and the body overseeing this, this public monument. It, of course, immediately shocked them because they had asked Rodin to produce a monument celebrating that central, that first burger that had stepped forward, Eustace de Saint-Pierre. Rodin came back instead with this piece that commemorates six individuals, all six of those burgers that had stepped forward in, 18, in, in 1347. And this was a, a sort of a little, to the, the, the commission was a little puzzled by this, and Rodin replied that they were getting six for the price of one, that he wasn't raising his price um, for this. But he felt it was very important to commemorate each of those individuals that had participated in this event. And, and, and to that end, each of these six individuals is all of the same size. Um, Eustace de Saint-Pierre is actually not even in the center. He's a little bit off to the right. Each of these figures are also seen in motion, and they have a high degree of kind of um, emotion and gesture. And our Rodin was even starting just at the my image on the, the right um, is of the back side of the piece. So he was already giving some thought to how it would look as as um, individuals in the city of Calais might walk might walk around it. One thing that you'll notice um, here as well is that it, it is on a very high pedestal, and it's one that has even the suggestion of, of these rounded arches below it. He was, uh, Rodin was thinking of this in a kind of triumphal arch um, for, formation. Uh, despite some criticism and some pushback um, from, um, from the town of Calais, 
Rhoda, and continued to sort of pursue this, um, this um, commission and to continue to, in a sense, do his research um, for the piece. He uh, quite, he had, he, when he had signed the contract um, with the, the town of Calais, he would agree that he, he agreed to, to make changes as requested, which is something that he actually never again did um, and that he would consistently kind of following this would sort of uphold his artistic integrity and refuse to make um, changes even if that meant that the commission failed or um, was never was not realized in his lifetime. Uh, one of the things he does here, however, I, I think quite cleverly, is he, he agreed to make um, changes as request. He said, I'll, I'll make those changes. I'll, I'm continuing to tweak the figures. But yet he went on sort of steadfastly in pursuing his own, his own vision uh, for the piece. And over the course of, of 11 years, essentially, wore down um, the, the townspeople and, and, and got them to sort of embrace um, his idea. But his research, um, and this is something that Rodin does with a number of other monuments, in particular his monument to Balzac, which he would uh, receive a few years later. Um, but he, he wanted his models um, to reflect the, the region of Calais. Um, so much so that he approached his friend, the painter, Jean Cazin, um, to be a model for Eustace de Saint-Pierre. Um, Cazin actually claimed to be descended um, from Saint-Pierre. This is something that um, Rodin always sort of prized because he felt that his um, that his figure, that something of the physiognomy of, of the, both the region and of the family would somehow be imbued into to his piece. Um, so we, we, you see, this is the, the head on the right is the one that's actually in, um, in the exhibition. Um, Kazan is thought to have modeled uh, for the head of Eustace de Saint-Pierre, um, not the body. You'll notice um, even in the photo that Kazan has a slightly more robust figure than that more emaciated um, emaciated body that we see and the sort of more uh, sort of hunger starved body of of Eustace um, in the final monument. Um, another model that um, that is thought to have worked with Rodin for this piece is Pignatelli. He was an Italian um, workman who Rodin had had met. He was the model as you can imagine here for the John the Baptist preaching and I show this um, just to make the point that Rodin didn't um, select um, sort of young I, you know models with um, particularly idealized or quite beautiful bodies. He was looking for kind of an every man and every Every woman. So he consistently liked to pick models um, that were not, um, that were someone we might meet, and frankly, they were people that he met on the street. Um, they were not necessarily professional um, artist models. He also um, turned to a friend, the actor Coquelin Cadet. Um, Cadet was actually a, a comedian, uh, which is somewhat um, sort of amusing to think about him modeling for this sort of tragic subject. Um, but perhaps that was because as, a, as an actor, he was able to hold his pose for long periods of time and, and Rodin um, certainly would have needed um, Cadet to hold that pose um, for you know, probably 20, 30 minutes at a time. And I think, I hope you can see in the head to the left that Rodin was able to just sort of bring some of the expression on, um, on his model's face, not just, and bring that out, not just in the eyes or the mouth, um, but even into the forehead and the lips. And this is something that we, we always find um, in, often find in Rodin's work, is that he, it's not enough um, just for the, the, the sort of, um, the the larger portions of a, of a body to express emotion, but even those toes and fingers and eyebrows um, and the like. But in addition to working um, with, with models, Rodin also created a series of full-size plaster figures um, in the studio, and he worked with them um, with these nude figures as well. He's just, it, the Burgess of Calais is, is quite striking in Rodin's of um, because it is one of the few clothed um, subjects that he works on. Almost um, all of his, his sculptures, as you'll see in the exhibition and elsewhere around the world, are nude. Um, and this is largely because he, um, I, think, I think, quite cleverly recognized that there was a kind of timelessness that would um, come out with the, these figures being, um, being unclothed. It was also sort of his um, great interest in the human body as a source, um, a source of expression. 
And, but he did feel in those in, in the instances in which he was working with clothed figures, like the Burgers of Calais, or later with his figure of Balzac, that it was important to start with a nude figure um, in the studio. Um, and to that end, um, you'll see in the exhibition a nude Balzac, so it, which is yet another step um, that Rodin had undertaken in the, the, his work on that monument. And in this, you can see this is a studio view that actually in the background you can see the second maquette um, for, for the Burgers of Calais in which it, instead of uh, that first sort of cubic block that you saw, in the next version he created individual figures um, so that they, he could sort of play around with their positioning. And I think this is what we see um, in the next um, series of photographs. This is a particularly well um, photographed series. And in this next group, um, this is, um, of course, Eustace um, St. Pierre. We, we see Rodin working um, and having these photographed from, from many angles. And it, it was thought, um, I think, for a number, a number of years ago that these photographs were taken after he was finished uh, modeling the figures. But then there's discovery of a number of photographs that Rodin has actually sort of penned, made all kinds of sort of scribbles um, onto them. And this is really, these are working documents um, for, for Rodin. It seems that he invited this photographer to his studio while he was in the midst of working on the clay model for, um, for the drapery, and that he essentially wanted the, these photographs to allow him to kind of step back a little bit from the figure and to kind of study how it was working. Um, he is even the, the the plaster model that he, of uh, Eustace in the studio didn't have fingers. The hand had been broken off. He'd, he'd been struggling with how to model those fingers and to capture the, the right uh, sort of sense of emotion in them. And it, you might just be able to see in this, um, in this photograph that he's kind of completed the fingers here. And then he seems to be using these long lines um, to sort of deepen the, the shadows and of, the, of the drapery. And this is a way of kind of, I think, for him, working out a sense of the, light, the fall of light um, onto this piece um, when it's eventually cast um, into, um, into bronze. And this is part of a really quite um, laborious process that Rodin engaged in for most of his major um, monuments. I mentioned that it took him 11, he spent 11 years working on this um, piece. They were not um, 11 years of nonstop work. There were a number of interruptions along the way. Um, he worked quite um, sort of enthusiastically and was very engaged in it um, for a number of years from 1884 to roughly 1889 when he exhibited um, the first um, sort of complete um, model of the, um, of the Burgers of Calais at an exhibition, a joint exhibition with the work of Claude Monet um, in Paris. But in the intervening years, the, um, the town of Calais, which had sort of raised um, about 15,000 francs to pay for this piece, um, had encountered a, a financial crisis and they'd actually lost that entire sum. Um, so the piece was essentially put on hold um, while they recovered from that financial crisis and were able to reopen the subscription and to raise money um, for, for this piece. Um, so it's such that by 1895, um, about 11 years later, they were able to, um, to, to sort of work, start working on the casting of this piece. Um, by this point, many of the um, sort of criticisms to a Rodin's piece, in particular, um, a number of people felt that it should have had a pyramidal um, sort of shape and that the central figure of Eustace de Saint-Pierre um, should have been sort of rising up. He should have been taller, perhaps larger um, than the others. That that sort of criticism had, to some degree, um, faded away, but there was still um, a great deal of, of concern um, about the piece um, at the time that it was unveiled in, uh, in, in the middle of, of Calais in, in 1895. Um, a number of, of people, even um, members of the, the commission in Calais felt that the, the figures looked too downtrodden. They didn't look heroic enough. Um, these are, of course, individuals who look um, very extraordinarily thin. They're sort of, um, sort of seem to be tormented by this choice um, to sort of sacrifice themselves um, to the Edward, the, Edward III in return for saving their, their fellow citizens. There continued to be a sort of confusion about the moment that was being depicted, and Rodin was, was quite adamant that he wanted to capture the moment that when each man has made the decision um, to, to sort of 
to surrender himself um, to the king. And so you, we see them in different stages of kind of um, giving up their, um, their, in a sense, their lives, walking away from their families, walking away um, from, um, from the town. Many people um, misinterpreted this as the burghers arriving um, before Edward the, the Third, and they wanted these these figures to look a little more um, sort of resolute and, and, and determined in their um, in their commitment to um, to their this this heroic um, gesture. So we're looking at a bird's eye view of of, of the city of, of Calais, um, and you can see right in the center. Um, this was the Parc Richelieu, uh, which was in the, sort of on, on the outskirts of the the, prop, the town of Calais itself, and sort of bordering that suburb of, of Saint Pierre. Rodin had a, had two confl had two ideas um, for the the the, um, the base for this piece. He thought it should be either extremely elevated, maybe 20 feet into the air. He actually imagined the burghers of Calais perhaps installed somewhere overlooking the sea and sort of being below, having the wind um, blow about them and, and um, seeing them sort of from below um, it, it, and, and how that would sort of enhance the grandeur of the piece. His other idea was that perhaps they should be right down on the paving stones um, in that they could be literally sort of allow the, the townspeople of Calais to kind of elbow them as they went about their everyday business. And that this would remind those citizens you know, eight, in the 1890s of the heroism of their ancestors and remind them of kind of the possibility um, for each of us in our daily lives to sort of emulate um, some of that, that grandeur and, um, and, and some of that self-sacrifice. <clears throat> and he was he he, um, he he didn't he lost that battle at least initially. Uh, we'll go on to hear more about what he um, the, the afterlife of this piece. Um, he he finally um, settled on this base, which is kind of a compromise base. It, it looks a little bit like if you remember the Joan of Arc um, sculpture that I showed you. It, it's elevated about four or five feet um, off the ground. It has this kind of fence to keep people from climbing on it um, because it is of course a piece that people even today, still love to climb on. Um, it was a number of critics um, and a number of Rodin's friends um, were, were disappointed, both that he, he wasn't able to realize placing this directly on the paving stones. They also lamented the placement of a public lavatory, which is the building that you see um, directly behind it, that they didn't feel this was quite, um, quite appropriate for the piece. Um, and, we'll, and then we'll go on, I'll, I'll talk a, in a little bit more about the kind of continued afterlife and the various movements that this piece um, has undergone. But I wanna spend a, a little bit of time um, talking about how Rodin sort of realized several other sculptures in the kind of the orbit of the Burgers of Calais. Um, he, he, he spent an extraordinary amount of time working on the hands um, for, for the Burgers. Um, so much so that this, um, the left hand and the clenched hand, um, both of which are in the current exhibition uh, are thought to have been initially modeled for the burghers of Calais. And this is a way, again, of sort of conveying that sense of, um, that sense of emotion through every, um, every part of, um, of the, the burghers' anatomy. This and the clenched hand are also were, were modeled in Rodin's studio in a period in which he was working very closely with Camille Claudel, um, uh, who was both his assistant and his lover at the time. Um, and so it's it's often thought that perhaps she had a hand, quite literally a hand, um, in in modeling um, these works. It's it's hard for us to know. It, it's it's quite possible that both Rodin and Claudel modeled these figures. They aren't signed, um, so it's it's difficult for us to go back in time and to fully understand um, the layers of collaboration between Rodin and Claudel. Nevertheless, I do want to note um, that they are, there's something very powerful about these pieces um, and that, that makes um, a number of individuals suspect that, um, that Claudel uh, worked on them. And then there's the hand of God. Um, this is yet another hand, and this is a whole body of, of Rodin's work was, was just involved in hands and the way that they could be incorporated into independent pieces. Um, this hand of God is, shows a one enlarged hand um, holding a, a sort of what appears to be a kind of um, a, 
a sort of piece of pure matter. Maybe it's uh, some. Maybe it's, it's, here it's it's bronze, but it might be some sort of stone or clay. There are two figures, a male and a figure, a human figure, coming out of this. Of course, that immediately um, takes our thoughts to Adam and Eve, and and how God has created um, man out of clay. But my interest in this piece um, is not from that front side, but from the back of it, which is this hand, that hand of, of God, which is so wonderfully um, seen from the back view. And I, the, the piece, um, I'm afraid you're, you're going to have to kind of find your way around it and to have to sort of peer behind it and hopefully not get in trouble with guards or others. Um, individuals in the exhibition to, to look at that back, um, the back side of it, because it is the hand, as you hope you might recognize by now, of one of the burgers, specifically. Pierre de Visson. Um, and this is something that Rodin loves to do. He loves to take a figure, or an element of a figure modeled for another purpose and to reuse it, to recycle it, to find um, another, another use um, for it. And that he does quite, um, quite beautifully in the hand of God. Another thing um, that he quite often did, and, and this is a piece sometimes dated to 1910, I think increasingly thought um, to have been done around the time of World War I. And this is, Rodin had you know, just bundles, and I'll actually advance forward. This is, he had just baskets and basket, baskets and, and shelves and cabinets full of hands and feet. Um, and heads that he'd modeled, and these were things that he was just kind of constantly at work um, playing around with getting just the right hand. And it was said that on Sunday afternoon, he would pull out these pieces and he would start um, to take them and to kind of assemble them into, um, into new works. And so this is a quite haunting, um, a piece that's never been sort of fully understood. It never had a title uh, given to it by Rodin. So we don't have any indication of where he thought this uh, was going, but but it consists of a number of heads of the burghers of Calais, a number of their hands, and then over the whole group is this winged figure which actually comes off um, of the gates of hell, and it seems to be a kind of protective uh, gesture. Um, hence our thought that maybe it has to do uh, with, with sort of a moment around uh, World War I, and he's thinking about that um, great um, sort of conflict there. This is, of course, a piece that it, in its use of fragments and, and bits and, and pieces um, is quite modern and really is looking well into uh, the 20th century and, and becomes an inspiration for any number of, of um, younger artists, you know, particularly perhaps we might think of a Brancusi who does a number of these um, heads and, and like, uh, similar um, pieces. Um, and then this, um, which is slightly menacing perhaps, or a uh, piece um, that involves the he plaster head of um, <clears throat> of Camille Claudel, and then it's, the, it's that hand again of Pierre de Visson, uh, which is, of course, larger than her head. So the two pieces are out of scale, um, and it, the hand is sort of somewhat protective. It's sort of, or, or is it protective, or is it sort of somewhat um, sort of threatening in its way? Um, this was thought to have been done around 1895 um, when Rodin and Claudel's um, relationship has ended. Um, Claudel was, was at that time uh, essentially closeted in her, her studio. She was not seeing very many people. She was um, feeling threatened by a number of enemies some real, probably quite a few more um, imagined, and this is a piece that I think um, is a quite poignant piece that I think Rodin imagines her um, in this hand sort of as a kind of in her, perhaps it's one that's in her, just in her mind as opposed to um, in, in reality. Um, it, to this end, you might also take a look in the exhibition of the shade with the two left hands also kind of encompassing um, his face that's um, in the exhibition. And also in the exhibition is this monumental head of Jean Lair, who is yet another of the burghers. Um, this is a piece that Rodin um, enlarged around, um, around 1908, it's a moment when he started to play around with the scale of his pieces. So he took a number of his, um, his known existing pieces and then had them enlarged two to three times um, to see what the change of scale did to the piece. I think one of the things that's um, quite striking here is that when he, when he enlarges it, 
he doesn't um, fall into a trap of feeling that he needs to add more detail to it. So if you take a look at this piece, um, you'll note that he hasn't added a great deal more detail um, to say the eyebrows or the hair or even that, that strange ear on, on either of the pieces and that he's allowed those to remain and then allow, allows us to kind of revel in uh, the various curves and the, of, of the surface and particularly these extraordinary um, sort of cheekbones and the facial structure of this individual. In, in, in enlarging this head though and, and in showing it just really almost sort of truncated and chopped off at the, um, at the neck, Rodin's also all, it's shifted slightly the angle of the head so that it's been elevated. He's not looking downward as he does in the, in the burgers, but, but looking outward. And this, this has changed, um, I think, the, 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 perhaps our, our feelings and our approach to this piece a little bit, and that it seems much more resolute um, as opposed to that kind of downtrodden figure that we see um, in the burgers of Calais. And just in closing, I wanted to say a few uh, more words about the burgers um, because they've had a, a fairly significant kind of afterlife or, or perhaps legacy, or maybe I should call it instead of afterlife, a, a continued life. Um, this is the burgers of Calais in one of their, their many, um, it, it, one of their many new locations. It's, it's um, somewhat ironic that this, this is a piece that, that is quite heavy. I mean, I, um, I, I think probably weighs um, between one to 2,000 pounds. Pounds, um, but yet these figures, as you'll see, are remarkably um, movable. So the, the Burgers of Calais in Calais has had several um, different um, locations. It was originally, as you saw in that bird's eye view, placed in the center of a park. It sort of swam in that, um, that great um, sort of open venue. It was later um, moved actually during both of the, the world wars and is now today installed in front of um, the, the city hall in Calais. So it's, it's actually now instead of joining the, the, the city in the suburb, it's actually um, directly in front of, um, of the, the city hall. And then in Rodin's lifetime and beyond, a number of additional casts were made. And it's kind of interesting to track the popularity of this piece um, around the world and over time. Um, in around 1900 to 1903, a cast um, was, was ordered by Carl Jacobson, who was the um, son of the founder of Carlsberg, uh, Carlsberg Breweries in Copenhagen, a great collector of, of both antique sculpture and of Rodin's work. Um, it's today a kind of centerpiece of the um, Nye Carlsberg Glyptothek in Copenhagen. Two casts were um, shortly ordered for um, two Belgian collectors. One resides um, outside in the castle and gardens of Marymount, which is just outside of Brussels. The second um, Belgian cast uh, was purchased, uh, it was owned by a Belgian collector who in 1911 um, sold it to the National Art Collection uh, Fund in England. And that um, piece was eventually installed in front of the Houses of Parliament um, in 1915. This is a, an interesting instance in which Rodin was very much still alive and he was actually asked to weigh in um, on the placement of the piece, its, act, its location in, um, in London. Uh, they initially thought that uh, they wanted to place it quite near the Wallace collection, um, but eventually that site wasn't available and so they settled on the banks of the Thames just outside um, the Houses of Parliament, which is a kind of adds a whole other set of meaning um, to it when you think um, about it in a, an English context and, and I think certainly celebrating perhaps the clemency of, um, of Edward III. This um, base that you see on the right was the original base um, for it when it was unveiled in 1915. That's the base that actually Rodin um, worked a great deal on it. So you see it's at a much higher um, level than any of those other pieces. Um, it was later, I think in the 1956 or so, brought down um, to its, its current um, base. Um, to fast uh, forward a little bit, um, great um, Philadelphia cinema magnet, Jules Massbaum, um, commissioned this piece um, in 1925. He Actually, I should say, this piece was commissioned um, by a Japanese collector in 1921 who um, was unable to take possession of it. And so when Jules Massbaum commissioned the piece, um, another Burgers of Calais in 1925, the Musée Rodin um, sent him this one, which they had kind of hanging about um, in... in um, I guess in their, in their storage. Um, Musée Rodin first acquired theirs in 1926. 
Basel in the, the 40s, actually in the midst of, of the war. The Hirshhorn um, collection in Washington, 1943. This is the Matsukata cast, that Japanese um, collector who wanted to buy a cast in 1921, finally was able to take possession of it in 1953. Norton Simon Museum, 1968. The Metz Museum cast uh, was done in 1985. And then the last cast was the Rodin Gallery in Seoul, which sadly has now closed, uh, was 1996. Um, the Rodin Museum in 1993 made a decision that they would, they would cap all of their editions at 12 sculptures. Um, and so in fact, there are um, no more burgers uh, to be had in quite that same format, but just as a kind of postscript, I wanted to add that the, um, the Cantor Center for the Visual Arts in Stanford um, tackled this in a very interesting way by, by um, by, by commissioning um, individual statues of, of the burghers of Calais and then placing them in this kind of very open arrangement, um, which allows, of course, um, individuals, get, you know, visitors, students and the like um, to really wander among them, amongst them. Um, it was a quite an intriguing idea and one that I suspect um, Rodin would have found appealing. Um, and then uh, also another solution taken um, by, by the National Gallery of Australia in Canberra. Um, and this is, I, I think, a, a nice note on which to, to end and, the, and to, to sort of um, note that this, this piece um, has an extraordinary resonance today and continues to kind of appeal um, to us for the notion of this kind of sense, of sense of individuality and the inner experience of each of these six individuals as they were facing um, an uncertain future and leaving their families and their their town beyond, behind. Um, and I think it encapsulates a little bit of, of Rodin's um, sort of genius and his talent um, for taking what could have been a, a very dry historical moment. And this, I, I should, of course, remind us that this is something that Rodin had never experienced except um, in the, those, those chronicles, um, and to bring it to life in such a, a powerful way that it continues to kind of um, attract our sort of interest um, and um, and, and um, sort of um, our, our interest and excitement uh, today. So on that note, I will, I will end my formal remarks, but I'd be delighted um, to take questions because I, I suspect there may be a few uh, in the audience. Thank you. Good. All right, yes, I, sorry, in the, in the white jacket? Yeah. So the question is uh, whether these are uh, these pieces are transported from place to place, whether they're the, the, whether the burgers that I just showed you were the same one or different ones. Um, I just they're they're all individual um, pieces. Um, so Rodin. Um, Rodin was a very um, clever at marketing himself and, and also thinking ahead to his legacy. And when he um, died in 1917, he was quite clear in his will that his pieces should continue to be cast in bronze after his death. Um, he recognized that this was um, a way in which he could be sort of appreciated around the globe. Um, and and, and this, this practice of casting in multiple versions is something that was not new with Rodin. It had, artists had been doing this for generations. Um, it, was, it was somewhat essential for a sculptor because it, it, sculpture is a quite costly, costly business. And if Rodin had spent 11 years working on one piece for which he was paid a kind of fairly measly um, 1,500 francs, um, he would never have been able to sort of survive or to support a studio of about 50 assistants. Um, and so that he felt that it was important that his pieces um, be cast multiple times. Um, it, current um, law and, and practice of the Musée Rodin really now caps each of these editions at 12. Um, but prior to that, um, some, some of Rodin's pieces are known in hundreds. Um, and that was really um, something that he did in his lifetime. He would, would have these pieces cast in multi, la very large editions as a way of, of kind of realizing some income to enable him to keep, um, keep producing new pieces. So, yeah, thank you. Yes, green shirt. Thank you so much. Yeah. Oh,
No, two very um, astute comments. One about um, this this sort of interest in, um, I, I guess, in, in sort of medicine and and, and um, the physiognomy of these um, these um, these pieces. And I think that's and they're, and they're in thinking about neurology and the like. Um, it's a very interesting subject, and then there are a number of Rodin scholars that are, are thinking um, about that. Um, it, it's clear that Rodin did have um, some awareness of, of sort of medical practices at the time. Um, perhaps he wasn't visiting hospitals um, so much as he was using and perhaps consulting a number of, of medical um, journals and, and books and illustrations. There's a, some great work that's being done um, by a British scholar about this. Um, about this right right now, um, I, I've actually had we've had any number of doctors and the like who come into the Rodin Museum in Philadelphia and have been able to sort of diagnose um, various um, <laughs> um, various uh, conditions from from the pieces. And um, your your second question or observation about the sense of motion and, and thinking about um, dance, I think, is one that that is also equally fitting um, with Rodin because he was quite fascinated by dancers, um, particularly a group of Cambodian dancers um, that he, he that he drew them a number on a number of occasions um, in the early 20th century. Um, he worked as well with a number of actors, and particularly a Japanese um, actress by the name of Hanako, um, and this again was a sense of, um, of bringing that sense of motion into play. But but in the case of Hanako, he would actually have her hold the poses uh, for great periods of time that enabled him to kind of capture um, to capture that sense of motion um, in his in his clay. So thank you for this. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Yes. Very good question. The question is, how do you cast such a monumental piece? Um, and the, 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 you cast it in many pieces, and then you, 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 you piece them together, um, essentially. In fact, I, I have a, a few extra slides that I, we didn't get to in place of time, but I will um, fast forward. This is a little bit of the story of the, the Philadelphia Burgers of Calais, which was, um, oh, sorry, I'll go back, which was placed um, on the outside of the museum initially in 1928. It was decided to move it in the 50s. It moved up to the art museum. It moved back to the Rodin Museum. We moved it out in 2012. And then um, this is the piece I wanted to get to. Um, the slide I wanted to get to, which is to, to show you that each of those figures is cast individually, and then they're bolted into um, essentially the base. And so many of these are cast in parts. The, the Gates of Hell, for instance, was cast um, in, I think, 46, or it was shipped to Philadelphia in 46 different crates, um, and then assembled um, on, the, on, on the spot. Um, so these are, it's a very complicated process, the casting um, process. One that is, um, the French were extremely sophisticated um, at casting these pieces. Rodin himself um, was, was never particularly involved um, in the casting process. He assigned, he, he left that to, um, to the, those who had that specialty. He would advise on the patinas, um, but he, he left that in the hands of Rudier and, and other um, foundries that were really quite sophisticated in, in casting these in pieces um, and then sort of soldering them together and, and adding the patinas. Does that give you sense? Great. Sure. 
Um, so there are a couple of other pieces. I think the, the Burgers of Calais nicely um, encaps, you know, nicely does this in about 12, or I, I showed you 14 um, different versions. There are, um, the, the Gates of Hell is another one we might be able to, to do it. Um, there are, uh, to date, um, I think there are seven casts of the Gates of Hell, so there's still five more to go. Um, and that's an interesting one in that you see the interest in the, the Gates of Hell. Uh, we have the very first cast in Philadelphia. The second cast is in Paris. Um, there is a cast, of course, in um, Stanford, then the Cantor Center, um, but there are casts in um, Seoul and in Tokyo. The most recent cast of the Gates of Hell is in Mexico City. Um, and so it's interesting to kind of see this interest in Rodan travel the globe. I wouldn't be surprised if there was a Gates of Hell in China before too long, and perhaps even in India. And so it's, it's, it's interesting to track these pieces around the world and to, to see how um, the interest in Rodan you know, continues um, to be so appealing um, to, to audiences. Um, around the globe. Another piece, you might be able to do it with it as well as the, the monument to Balzac, um, which of course is installed um, in a great um, sort of intersection in Paris. Um, they're often, it, it's not always installed there, but there's it's a monument to Balzac in the garden of MoMA in New York. And so there, it's interesting to see these pieces um, in different contexts around the world. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah, the, you're, you're absolutely right. The thinker is one that's there are 20, there are 20 versions as well. So you could, you could do a kind of survey of, of the thinker and, and not, of course, lose sight of the one at the Cleveland Museum of Art, which was the subject of a bomb in, in, 19, in the 1960s, which again shows how these pieces sometimes can continue to play a, a political role. I'm sorry, there's a, a gentleman in the um, second section. So the question is about why Philadelphia is the second largest. And, and actually, we, I, I should say, we, we used to be the second largest collection outside of France, but that has now been taken over by the Sumaya Museum in Mexico City, which now has um, more Rodins than, than we do in Philadelphia. And I think maybe even the Metropolitan Museum of Art has, has more um, Rodins. But the, the Rodin Museum in, in Philadelphia is, is uh, thanks to really one individual. And this is a man named Jules Massbaum, who is a Philadelphia cinema magnate who went to Paris in 1924, um, visited the Musée Rodin, fell in love with the work of the sculptor, walked home that day with one piece in his pocket, and then placed an order for about 125 um, other, um, other bronzes. And then he, um, he had this, this building, um, sorry, I'll go back. He had this building created um, for the collection. He, he, he died before it was co completely finished, um, but he, he built this the building is built to display, um, display his Rodin collection. And so it's a quite a wonderful uh, Beaux-Arts building that kind of both marries sort of sculpture inside the museum and outside. Um, and so it's become a kind of jewel box um, of, a, of a museum and it's a, a great legacy that he left um, to, to the city of, of Philadelphia. Yeah, and that, you know, there, there are other collectors, the, the Sumaya Museum um, in Mexico City is, um, has been created by Carlos Slim, who has, I think, perhaps a kind of equal, equal passion for the, um, for the work of Rodin. Um, Iris and, and B. Gerald Cantor um, had, uh, you know, shared, um, shared, perhaps exceeded um, Massbaum's enthusiasm um, for, for Rodin, but they took a, a different approach uh, with their collection. So instead of creating a, um, a, a museum devoted solely to, um, to their collection, they chose to, to make extraordinary gifts to collections around the world. So there's a, a nice um, group of the, the Cantor bronzes at the Cantor Center for the Visual Arts. There's a um, particularly strong group in Brooklyn, and then they've made gifts to numerous um, museums around this country as a way of you know, continuing that dissemination um, of Rodin's work. Um, the, the Burgers of Calais was actually taken off view um, in Calais um, during both world wars, and it was, it was actually taken um, to the basement of City Hall, um, I think during World War I. World War II, I think it was actually taken to a kind of um, a, a storage facility well outside um, in, in the countryside. So uh, it was moved around um, quite a bit to, to protect it. 
I think we'll take one last question, and then I know there's a reception waiting for us, and I'd be happy to answer more questions there, but yeah, go ahead. Okay. No, that's all. Oh, thank you. That that that's um, when you're uh, sort of when you go to Paris, a, a sort of must see stop is the Musée Rodin, which is in the center of Paris. Um, but if you have the time, I would, as um, a colleague has uh, has just commented, um, visiting Rodin's home at Meudon, which is just outside the city of Paris, is absolutely magical um, because you you see where he worked, his studios, um, and then their extraordinary um, collection of of plaster um, cast there. And so um, it's a, a great day trip from Paris and a, a wonderful opportunity to really get even closer to the artist and to visit his grave um, where he's the cat, one cast of the thinker um, sort of sits on top of his graves and sort of looks out um, into the surrounding countryside and out onto the, the city of Paris. So on that note, I think we'll close and I will invite you to the reception. Continue conversation.